She raised four kids that were all only children. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, we have no siblings other than our brothers and sisters, but, but we were raised like only children. She believed that every one of us was unique and different and therefore was raised differently. Now some people call that random and you know, but it was true. And the other thing she taught me was um, no matter what happens, good, bad, uh, surprised, predictable, whatever it is, um, the first thing we ought to do is take responsibility. If we screw up, okay, I screwed up. If we did well, okay, I did well. But, but there weren't, my mom was never more impressed with one or the other. She just wanted us to take responsibility for something. If there was a, a need that surfaced, uh, and I would be griping about why no one is stepping into the gap and fixing this, you know, then it was usually her would come to me and go, so what are you doing about it, you know? And uh, I hated that about my mom, actually, but, you know? So now we come to, we're in this series of uh, messages on Nehemiah, from uh, the book of Nehemiah, and, um, and this whole issue of uh, taking responsibility personally becomes really a focus in this. And so, uh, thank you, Mom, for, for reminding me of that. Every day of your life. But that's positive, I guess. So, well, for those of you who weren't here the last couple of weeks, Nehemiah uh, was the poison taster for the king uh, in what was what we now consider Iran. And uh, you heard about the, uh, the exiles uh, from Jerusalem who went back home, and now their cities are disarray, the walls are destroyed, and... Um, People are discouraged and downbeaten, and he goes to the king in a depression. And the king does not want his poison taster to be in a suicidal depression, you know, because that's dangerous to himself. So he asks him what's going on, and uh, and then offers to help, provides help, money, wood, lumber, uh, letters of uh, authority, so that he is not bothered, and time to get away and go back and help rebuild the wall, which uh, Nehemiah now goes and does. Um, in chapter 3, I'm not going to read the whole thing because, you know, have you ever just done that thing where you want to read the Bible and you open up and it starts the begats and it's like some name after begat, 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 you know, the end. this is kind of like that, only it's about working on the, on the wall. Uh, but I'll give it a try, okay, and I'll hop around a little bit. Uh, Nehemiah 3. Um, Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hasanah. They laid the beams and put the doors and the bolts and the bars in place, and uh, going down to verse 6, the Jashana gate, you all were wondering about that, that was repaired by jo Joiada, the son of Pasea. See, this is, this is why, you know, we, it sounded easier in Hebrew. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Uh, Rephiah, son of her ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section adjoining this. Jediah, son of Harumaf, made repairs opposite his own house. The valley gate was repaired by Hanun and the residents of Zanoah. Good to know. They rebuilt it and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. They also repaired 500 yards of the wall as far as the dung gate. They didn't go past that. You know. uh, the fountain gate. Oh, oh, no, let's do that. The dung gate was repaired by Mount. Kija, son of Rechab, that was a bad job, ruler of the district of Beth HaKerem, he rebuilt it and he put its doors and bolts and bars in place. The fountain gate was repaired. Anyway, you're getting the point of this, right? It's a whole other pages. <laughs> Don't want you to miss any of it. Uh, the repairs next to him were made by the priests from the surrounding region, and beyond them, Benjamin and Hashub made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of Messai, the son of and Ananiah made repairs before his house. You getting it? Above the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. 
Next to them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. Between the rooms above the corner and the sheep ate the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. That's chapter 3. Then we get to chapter 4. I'll just do a little bit here. When Sanballat, remember there was the three people who were opposing this whole deal? When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. And he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even if a little fox climbed up on it, it would break down their wall of stones. And then Nehemiah prays this. Hear us, God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they've thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall. This is a cool section, even though it may seem really eccentric to you. So let's pray. Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might live uh, in, uh, in your ways and how we might uh, share the responsibilities that you, uh, that you bring to us. Give us the courage to look around and uh, see our world through your eyes. That's what we need today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, when I was young and, and uh, smarter, uh, when I had answers for everything, I believed that the most important thing that a person could do is develop their faith. I thought that's pretty, but you don't disagree with me, do you? Who would, you know? And then after, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years at seminary, teaching at the seminary and everything, I started thinking, no, that's not enough. People need to go beyond their faith and they need to develop a biblical theology. And so I started preaching about you know, theology and stuff, which bored a lot of people. But um, <laughs> now I'm old and I, and, uh, and I'm, I've forgotten everything that I used to know. But I'm starting to think that a biblical faith and a biblical theology is not enough. I think that what uh, God wants for us, particularly as, a, as our little community of faith and uh, our, our church here, um, this little part of the world, um, he wants us to have a biblical strategy. It's not just what we believe. It's not just... Uh, how we order our little personal life, but is there a, actually a strategy given to us in the Bible for how we might uh, share together and live together and serve together and move out into, into the community? And guess what? I think there is. So that's why I'm, I brought it up to you, you know, just in case you're wondering if that was rhetorical. Uh, no, actually. Um, and in, in this Nehemiah chapter 3, we see a picture of what I think is a biblical uh, strategy for getting things done. Um, it's not it's not going and finding somebody who's really good and has an awful lot of time and have them do everything. See, I, I used to, uh, I worked at a church where I, I was in charge for a little while, a very short time, uh, down in uh, Solana Beach, California, and I was in charge of their uh, evangelism and outreach program. And so uh, what I did was I found like the four people in the congregation who gave a riff about evangelism and outreach. And I made them a committee. <laughs> and I said, all right, you're our evangelism and outreach people. And we announced it to the congregation. And that was the end of evangelism in our church. Uh, because everybody thought, well, it's their job now. <laughs> We've got somebody to do it. I don't have to talk to my neighbor over coffee about what's going on in my life and how God's dealing with me and how I need to trust Jesus this week and this because I don't have it together. I don't have to share that anymore because we've got people who are trained and ready to go. It was the worst thing we ever did. <laughs> um, but 
because when we have people who are experts at something to do it, what's our role? Nothing. Well, we can spectate or we can say, no, you missed a spot. You know, come on, over there. You missed a spot. You didn't do that very well. Go back. We can do that, which is basically what's become of churches in America, across America. Churches are filled with people who sit there uh, and, and watch the experts and then say, no, 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 I, I like it better over there. Kind of like those two old guys in the Muppet Show, remember that? Yeah. The set up in the balcony, <laughs> Waldorf and uh, Statler. 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 Yeah, the grumpy ones, yeah, the grumpy ones. And they're always going, I don't think this is a show. What kind of show? Hey, that's not music. I don't know. You know that, that, that's just like our congregations that I've served. <laughs> you know, sit up there and go, you call this a sermon? You know. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but that's what happens when, when we think it's somebody else's job. It, in, uh, in this rebuilding of the wall in Nehemiah, the, the greatest thing that Nehemiah did was he didn't build the wall. He came in with the king's authority and wood and the, took the forest away and all that stuff and, and as an army accompanied him and authority. He had everything he needed to march in and start building the wall and have everybody stand around and watch. No, I don't like the way, I don't like those bolts. Go back to Home Depot. And, uh, but it doesn't do that, does he? What happens? Everybody gets involved and does a little bit of building in front of where they are. Did you hear, hear how many times it says, so they fixed the wall in front of their house. <laughs> Maybe that's a biblical strategy. Maybe that's what God wants us to do. In front of our house, right here, where we are, so our view's okay. And then it says, and then the person next door, I know they didn't build a wall in front of their house. Well, you know what happens if you do that enough times? Pretty soon you get a wall, right? And the repairs were being made. Everybody did a little, and then some of them, they did something. And then if you read, if you read chapter 3 this week, which I know you will because you just love those names. If you read chapter 3 again this week, you'll find that some people build a wall in front of their house. And then they show up eight verses later working on some other part of the wall. Where they decided, that was so much fun, let's go over and help these people. And then they, they'll move on over and pretty soon they get another one over there. That's a biblical strategy. It's everybody shoulder to shoulder. Uh, Doing what they can. Some people were identified because of where they lived. Some people were identified because of their jobs. Like the priests did this gate. And then they had a worship service there. Because you know, that's what priests do. you know. And uh, other people just did it because it was right in front of them. So they went, well, why not? Let's do this. And then they had some, like, like they said, the goldsmiths, the silversmiths. They came in at the very end and they did some other stuff. They used their gifts, right? What they could do. You don't want the priest doing the finish work. That's, that's for the people who know what they're doing. So I, I look at that and I go, that, it, I mean, in a way, honestly, isn't that what Harbor Church has done from the beginning? Isn't that our DNA? Well, you don't catch me doing any ministry. <coughs> Um, wait for the people watching on the video. <laughs> wait, I'm confused by this. You know, no, I mean really, I, I may be one of the ministers here, but who isn't? Right? Aren't we all? If we're following Jesus, we're called to follow Jesus in ministry. My job is to get out of the way so y'all can do it. Uh, this morning, I was sitting back there on the box and. I was suddenly in the middle of Randy Tom's prayer. I went, that boy could pray. <laughs> uh, it, did, did you yeah, notice that? Yeah, yeah. I went, oh man, he can pray for me any day. <laughs> Amen. Who knew? <laughs> I mean, you know, really. And, uh, and, and he, was, he was doing ministry here with us, right? You bet. That, that's what that's about. No, we're not making him the official prayer. No one else can pray in this church. But, but you know what I mean here, that uh, God uses each one of us if, if we're willing to, to be used by him. So in the biblical strategy, we have this kind of shoulder to shoulder, and, and we're, we're doing our parts in it, and uh, <clears throat> what we have. And then uh, 
there's ways that this starts to fall apart. And this goes back to my mom, Laurel Westfall, daughter of the guy who ran the Hollywood Park racetrack. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. but, um, she's the one who Walt Disney came to the house and had toys in the trunk for her. <laughs> who does that? But um, it's taking responsibility. One of the ways that we block a biblical strategy is by saying, that's not my problem. That's not my issue. I don't need to become involved in that. As soon as we say, this is really for someone else to deal with, the biblical strategy goes out the window. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to all, you know, cultivate codependence and, and take responsibility for everybody around us and all that. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about saying uh, we have a right and a privilege and a calling to be responsible in, the, in our life and among the people that, that we serve. And, and that means that we respond appropriately to the situations that we're in. Um... The, there's another thing that undermines the strategy. Not just that we don't take responsibility, but sometimes we make excuses. Not, not, not you, you know. Like we've talked before about like Moses, you know, burning bush. He had all these great excuses. Well, uh, who are you to ask me to do this, God? And, and who am I to do this? And what will they say? And I have a disability. And I, you know, and, and then finally, I don't want to. <laughs> you know, that's Moses at the burning bush right there. And uh, I just don't want to do it. Um, that takes away the biblical strategy. Have you ever seen somebody and, and then and came up with an excuse why you couldn't do it? No? <laughs> oh, you guys are so good. <laughs> You're so lying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's something very powerful about seeing all these unpronounceable names. Because each one represented a person, just like you, and a family, and a neighborhood, and they had issues, and they had problems, and they had stuff to deal with, and all these things that the neighbors all knew about. So when, when this was first written, everybody went, oh yeah, Zacharula, boy, he was a mess. <laughs> but he did that wall there, you know, by the dung gate. <laughs> so at least he did that. But he was sure a mess. But each one of those names was personal. We're not just talking about ideas out there and <laughs> ministry needs out there or pray for the missionaries. I always hated that because I was a missionary kid, you know, so they'd always say, let's pray for the missionaries. I want to yell, which ones? Hmm. Well, you know, just missionaries. Hmm. Well, what's their problem? Well, you know, I don't know. Well, why don't you find out? I'm, I'm speaking for God here, okay? <laughs> you know, God said, why don't you get to know him and then you'll know what to pray about? No, I just pray for missionaries. Sorry, I just lapsed into my growing up years. You know, right there, boom. <laughs> but, so we share. And, um, when we share, here's why the strategy is so powerful. When we share, burdens do become lighter. And I don't mean just the work, I mean our burdens become lighter when we share. You know, th th those of you who are in uh, uh, like AA groups and stuff like that, you know, recovery groups, you know that one of the keys to the whole deal is helping others. Even if it's coming a little early and making some coffee. And the coffee's not that good, by the way. <laughs> it's not meant to be, but um, it, when we get out of ourselves and we start sharing, something happens and our burdens become lighter. That's why we share. Right? It makes something doable. You know, we heard today... Uh, Richard shared about how he and, and Deborah were moving that piano, you know, and it fell over in the truck. And uh, <clears throat> okay, here's the thing you didn't know: 
before the service started, I was back getting a cup of coffee, as I am prone to do, and um, Deborah was there, and we were talking, and she said, Richard and I yesterday had a Westphalian day. <laughs> <laughs> a Westphalian day? <laughs> You had an experience, so my question to her was, so you had a day where everything went wrong? And she went, yeah, just like your life. <laughs> but, but and I come it, back for more. And you come back yeah. for more. You know, but the thing is, when, when we're sharing, we realize, you know, yeah, maybe what we're doing is impossible. So what? Let's do it. And, uh, I'm so glad they didn't call me to do the piano. Jeez, man. The other thing is, I think that when we share something, the joys get are greater because because joys are are great when when you're all alone, right? You know, that's good. Okay, but when we're sharing them, we're part of something, and we're seeing things happen, and God's working, and and our faith is growing, and we're our joy is more intense. And Jesus said, I came so that your joy will be complete. Jesus came for us to have joy. We don't dare miss that. And when we're shoulder to shoulder and we're doing things, that's what happens. Um, and I, I think another thing, when, when we got to chapter 4 and the, the criticism started rolling in, the mocking and all that stuff, which by the way, I've got a name for a band if we ever get a band going. Flog the Mockers. Isn't that a cool name for a band? Flog the Mockers. It's from uh, the Bible. <laughs> so anyway, that was, well, that was really random right there. Okay, so anyway, they're mocking. They're saying, you're going to finish in a day. You're going to bring the stones back alive. And then they go, what are you building? It's going to be Even if a little fox jumped up on it, the whole thing is going to come crumbling down. But when we're using a biblical strategy and we're working shoulder to shoulder and we're and we're moving out from ourselves to make a difference and we're doing this together we become stronger right it's not whether or not the wall stands it's whether we stand you get a whole bunch of broken people working together and they're stronger that doesn't make any sense but, but that's the biblical strategy. And so you don't wait until you've got your life together and everything's working and you're strong and you've been you know, spiritually working out in Bible studies and stuff, you know, you know, building up your pecs or whatever. And you don't do that. You, you start working where you're at. As broken and weak and wobbly as you are. And you become stronger because God's in the middle of it. That's the strategy. Get a whole bunch of really weak people together and then see what God can do. That's a great picture for me. I love that. Because we don't have to pull back. We don't have to uh, wade or hide away. But, but we see God doing something really big in, in the midst of it. Um, and you know over the years, I, you know, I have a couple of people that I quote all the time, you know, the theologians like Chris Christopherson or Dylan or, you know, uh, <laughs> So I, I was convicted about this many, many years ago, and I decided, you know, I've got to get hip, you know? And uh, words you never use in the same sentence, hip and John, you know, that's it. But, uh, so I went to, this. you don't know about this, you young people, but uh, there was a thing called Tower Records once uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, so I went into Tower Records, and uh, I was poking around looking to find somebody new to quote, you know? I'd run out of Dylan's, so I didn't know he'd keep writing. But um, the thing is, um, I went in and I was poking around and I hear behind me, Reverend, <laughs> which always makes me nervous. And my hands started sweating just as I said that. And uh, I turn around, there was this guy, you know, and he had the usual, you know, mixture of uh, poking and tweaking and uh, tatting and stuff, you know. And, and he was smiling behind me and he went, I go, do I know you? He goes, probably not, but I go to your church sometimes. I hear you preach. I work here. What are you doing here? Which is a fair question, you know. And, and, then, and, and I said, well, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm looking for some ideas for sermons. He said, you're looking for Jimmy Buffett or what? You know, now that hurt. 
<laughs> I said, no, you know, I want something, you know, a little more, a little more current. So he goes, well, um, I don't, I, I, I'm not really a religious person, but maybe I could help you with your sermon. Oh, yeah. He goes, of course, you probably listen a lot to Verb Pipe. <laughs> yeah. You know, any sentence that starts with verb pipe, you know, that just doesn't work for me. But, but anyway, you really need to be listening to that, Pastor. So I, I bought it, went out. Um, this is what the person pointed me to. I don't even know if verb pipe is still going, but I wrote this down. And I told, I told him as I walked out, I went, you know, someday I'm going to use verb pipe in a sermon. Who knew it would take this long? <laughs> okay. This is what verb pipe said. When I was young, I knew everything. Then the song goes on. It talks about uh, suicide, abortion, failed marriage, all these kinds of things. Uh, we tried to wash our hands of this. We never talk of the lack of relationships, and now we are guilt-stricken, sobbing with our heads on the floor. We fell through the ice when we tried not to slip. We'd say, I can't be held responsible. I won't be held responsible. She fell in love in the first place. For the life of me, I cannot remember what made us think that we were ever wise, that we would never compromise. For the life of me, I cannot believe that we would ever die for these sins. I won't be held responsible. We were only freshmen. <coughs> maybe we are responsible. Maybe we are responsible. And maybe, you know, we look at our life and life around us and we go, we're responsible because God wants us in it. Right in the middle of it. Shoulder to shoulder. That's the strategy. Because in the process, who cares if the walls and the buildings get rebuilt? In the process, we get built. And really, it's all about building strong people, right? We're doing ministry. So that's the strategy. That's enough for today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. And we thank you that you never, never leave us sitting around on our own terms. So Lord, take hold of us today. We invite you. Take hold of us and help us to look outward and live outward and, and trust you and places and situations we might be really uncomfortable and uh, and stay very close while we're while we're following you Lord, come into our lives once more maybe for the first time maybe for the hundredth time fill us with your spirit fill us with your joy and uh, give us the courage to take responsibility shoulder to shoulder amen